Good afternoon. Good. I'm Arthur Evans. I'm the commissioner of the Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And um, it's a little bit about my, <laughs> I shouldn't be up there, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what that slide is about in a moment. Um, <laughs> I'm not a trend, <laughs> is that what I'm trying to say? Um, I forget, lost my track. <laughs> um, uh, in my day job, what I do is I oversee the city's behavioral health department. And uh, it's a fairly large department. Uh, we are essentially the safety net for 1.5 million people in Philadelphia. Um, and we have uh, contractual relationships with uh, large hospital systems, over 200 providers, community mental health centers, children's providers, a whole range of of organizations. And um, one of the things that uh, I'm gonna uh, disclose a little bit, one of the things you should know about me is I love being a psychologist. I love it. I was born to be a psychologist. And I know that. And every day I deal with really, really complicated problems. You work in an urban setting, in an urban setting, and you're the behavioral health commissioner, you get all kinds of very complicated problems that that land on your desk. And one of the things that I've observed is that many of those problems are problems that psychologists are really well suited to solve. But my observation is this, that the people who have to solve those problems don't know that psychologists have the skills necessary to solve the problems. And psychologists don't often see the opportunities in those challenges that people are struggling with. And so what I want to talk about are challenges that we see in the healthcare arena that I think psychologists are really optimally optimally, uh, suited to solve. And in there, I see uh, many opportunities for our field. Uh, And so now is the time that you can look at the slide. (laughs) Uh, And so I think that one of the things is if we're going to really understand what those opportunities are, we have to understand what the trends are in the healthcare field, and we have to be able to distinguish between trends and fads. Um, And and so what I want to do is first start with talking about what the current paradigm is, uh, and then lead into how this paradigm is problematic in how healthcare is changing and and where the opportunities are. So uh, this is uh, my view of the healthcare system in general and behavioral healthcare in particular. People get sick, they go to treatment, we fix them, and they leave well. That's a basic paradigm of our healthcare system. Wouldn't you agree? You have to say yes or I don't have a presentation. Folks, listen, I'm Baptist. You have to talk back to me. If I, if I ask you a rhetorical question, I will let you know. Otherwise, talk back. So this is the mental model for how we do our business. So the way we get health outcomes is people come to us as practitioners, we treat them, and they leave well. Right? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So it turns out, though, that there are a lot of challenges with this paradigm. I don't have time to go into all of them, but let me point out a few that are driving the changes that you're seeing in, in healthcare, particularly the Trump aims. Well, one of the big problems with this paradigm is that many of the people that need our help never come across our doors. 90% of the people in your community who are addicted to whatever are never gonna come to a treatment program. And 40 to 50% of the people who have mental health diagnosis aren't gonna come to a treatment program. And so if we have this passive system that relies on people recognizing that they have a problem, knowing how to come to us, not having any stigma associated with going to, coming to us, we're going to miss a lot of people. And it turns out that those people are often the drivers of health care costs in most health care systems. And we know it from studies that if you treat those people who are untreated, who have behavioral health conditions, you can save a boatload of money. Okay, so that's the basic premise. And so let me point out one other um, challenge that this model, this mental model of having to have a diagnosis before we can intervene uh, presents for us. Um, If you look at the the population, about 25% of the population has a mental health challenge, mental disorder. 
75% uh, are folks who, at any given time, don't have a mental health challenge. And the way our healthcare system is set up, it's binary. Either you are well and you don't need any intervention or help, or you have a diagnosis. Now, all of us in this room know that that's not the case, They're, that people are really on a continuum, that there are some people who are at risk, uh, for, who could benefit from some kind of intervention, but our healthcare system doesn't allow us to do that because that's the, not the way we finance healthcare. And we certainly um, are not able to do a lot of health promotion kinds of activities and those kinds of things. And so the problem that the healthcare systems are, are facing is if we are going to change the incentives, move from a fee-for-service system to a system that incentivizes keeping people well, we have to move to a population health approach. Now, if you, if you look up po population health, you'll find, if you get 100 hits on Google, you'll find 100 different definitions. But generally, <clears throat> the idea is this, that if we're going to ever control the costs of health care, we're going to have to put health care systems at financial risk. And so rather than having systems set up on this idea that come to us when you're sick, we'll treat you and then discharge you, healthcare systems are going to be responsible for populations of people. And the way they will be rewarded financially is by keeping that population as healthy as possible. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Remember what I told you? Thank you. Thank you. It's a good audience. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the paradigm shift that's happening in healthcare. Now, I think that this presents us some tremendous opportunities as psychologists. Because once you go to a population health way of thinking about healthcare, as opposed to a black box healthcare, uh, black, black box approach, it opens up lots of opportunities, I believe, for what we do as psychologists and the skill sets that we have. So let me just run through very quickly some of the, the elements of a population health uh, approach and some of the things that are required if tomorrow I were, to, I were to say to you, you're now responsible for the population of Washington, D.C. as the commissioner of mental health, and your goal is to keep the population as healthy as possible. Think about that. What would you do? Would you set up the black box and say, okay, we're going to try to run everyone through treatment, or would you come up with other strategies? Okay, so that's the essence of of moving to a population health approach. So let me give you a few of the, the elements of a good population health approach, my view. Uh, you have to deal with social determinants. Only 10 to 20% of health outcomes are derived from our healthcare system. 80% coming from social determinants, things that are happening in people's uh, communities, lifestyle, those kinds of things. And so one of the first things that comes up for us is that we have to move out of that black box. We have to move away from just thinking about psychotherapy and medications to a whole range of ways of intervening in communities to promote health. We have to start thinking beyond the individual level. If the only people we work with are people in a one-on-one -on -one or maybe a family situation, one of the things that this requires is thinking about neighborhoods and communities and how do we intervene at that level. It also means moving further upstream. So rather than waiting for people to have a diagnosis and come to us, how do we do assertive outreach into communities? How do we reach people earlier? How do we do earlier intervention? It means that we're going to work with people who don't have a diagnosis. It means that we're going to work in non traditional healthcare, non-traditional settings, not just integrated primary care settings, which I think is wonderful, and I'm glad that we're doing that, but we have to go into communities where people are, and we have to go to the, where people um, need our help the most, and often those are places that are uh, very non-traditional. Requires the development of new interventions and approaches, has to be data-driven, and the thing that I really like is that it puts the focus, I think there's an opportunity to put the focus on how do we help empower people to be, be, to be better stewards of their own health? How do we help empower? How do we do health activation? Everybody still with me? Okay, so I think that psychologists are really good at all of these things. We may not recognize it, we may not be doing it today, but these are the kinds of real world challenges that I face every day that I use the skills as a psychologist to deal with. So what I want to do is um, 
talk about and give you a few examples and help connect the dots between challenges of healthcare and what we can bring to the table. So I think a good population health approach uh, includes both a very effective treatment, but also community health strategies. And so I'm gonna give you a few examples from uh, our work in uh, Philadelphia. So um, you may notice that uh, um, treatment is not less important, in my view, in a population health. It becomes more important, and it becomes really important for it to be highly effective. Now, I think that psychologists can do a lot to help improve uh, treatment programs. So this is uh, language from our, uh, a recent RFP. So we required um, the program, a residential program, people who were responding to this RFP, to hire a psychologist. Uh, so here's a little um, uh, ad. This is why we need to be in policy, folks, so we can make those kinds of rules, right? So here's that's my plug for being in policy. So they have to hire a psychologist, and what you will notice from, in this language is it's not only about uh, delivering psychological services, but it's also about things like um, facilitating the implementation of evidence-based practices, um, facilitating um, uh, program evaluation. Those are skills that if you've gone to the training that we've gone through, that you have as psychologists. And so what we're saying is, if we're gonna have excellent treatment programs, you have to have this skill set embedded within those programs, and here are the kinds of things, the broad range of things that psychologists can do. Um, so one of the things that we've done in Philadelphia is to borrow very heavily from the public health world. And so one of the things that we do in, in public health is that we do screening. We screen for diabetes, we screen for cardiovascular disease, we screen for a lot of those things. We don't routinely do that in mental health. And so what we started doing a few years ago is um, uh, developing a screening strategy for behavioral health conditions. As I said, most of the people who need our help are not coming through our door, so how do we get to those individuals? So uh, this is our website. If you ever want to go to it, it's called healthymindsphilly.org. You will notice that it's nice and bright and it doesn't look like a government uh, website. That is by design because we wanted people to actually go there and use it. Um, and so uh, psychologists did the research to figure out what's the best screening tool for the population. Uh, we developed this website, uh, started with a few hundred people uh, going to the website. We've seen exponential growth, so we're now probably about 10,000 people a year. All of those, or most of those, are people who are not walking through our treatment doors. So we're, it's a way, a strategy for reaching that part of the population that needs us but may not be coming to us. It gives you um, options when you, um, if you screen positively or even if you don't. And uh, we're moving to the point where we're going to be able to uh, give people the option for online psychotherapy if they um, screen positively with a coach. So we're trying to automate because we're reaching a whole population that we wouldn't ordinarily uh, reach. We also do these screenings in the community. So we go in the community, uh, we put up a big sign that says, how are you feeling today? Or get a checkup from the neck up. Uh, people are curious, they come over. People thought people in Philadelphia would never go and do a mental health screening in public. Well, we found just the opposite. We just had a screening um, a few weeks ago. We had over 100 people to, to take the screening uh, and hundreds more to get information. But it's sort of going into communities and um, uh, reaching people where they are. Um, we've also taken the idea, and you heard uh, Nancy talk about uh, retail health clinics. So in most um, pharmacies now, you can go and you can take your blood pressure. We took the screening instrument put it into a kiosk, put it in a retail health clinic um, so that people could have access on their own walking into a, a health clinic. Uh, idea really caught on in Philadelphia. Now uh, Drexel University uh, does that. The, the screening company is called um, Screening for America, Screening for Mental Health. And um, we're taking that idea and embedding mental health screening tools uh, around uh, the, the city. The point is that uh, it's a way of reaching, if you, again, had pot responsibility for an entire population, how do you do that? How do you start to change the people's awareness around mental health issues? How do you start to identify people who might not otherwise be um, coming into our, our treatment programs? 
What I will tell you is that while these things look nice and easy, they are very complicated. How do you train people? What protocols do you set up? There are a whole set of things that I think psychologists are really well suited uh, to help. I'll just briefly mention this example. Um, uh, one of the things that happens in most communities is that uh, there are often uh, people are exposed to vicarious trauma or directly. Uh, typically what we've done in our system is to wait until people develop PTSD. We're now trying to be much more proactive and go into communities in the immediate aftermath, uh, educate people about what a normal trauma response is, what an abnormal response is, and how to get help. Really important if what we're trying to do is to intervene early. My last example is this. Um, I mentioned that um, stigma can be a huge problem in our, for, for our field. And, and, and often, well, if we develop the best treatment programs in the world, but people are embarrassed, are afraid to come to us, not gonna work. And so one of the things we've tried to do is to identify uh, ways of reducing community stigma. If you come to Philadelphia, this, the, that, you can see the rise there. That's actually a mural that's seven stories tall. This is from about a, a mile off. But if you come to Philadelphia, you'll see murals all over the, the city, which are uh, really done by the community. The person who runs the program, a woman named Jane Golden, has created this wonderful process of engaging communities around topics. Communities come together, um, develop the ideas, develop the, the, um, the concept, and then they actually paint the murals on what's called parachute cloth that's adhered to the wall, and then an artist comes by and finishes it off. So um, we started a few years ago using this process to engage communities about issues like um, suicide. So this is, this is a, uh, a wall that looks like, this was a, uh, um, a wall uh, prior to um, this mural being painted. Uh, a thousand people worked on this mural and it, it was a psychologist who worked with community members doing workshops on suicide, suicide survivors, family members of people who had died by suicide. Uh, they came up with this concept out of that process and over time, uh, as I mentioned, we had about a thousand people including firefighters and a lot of people who we would not have ordinarily uh, been able to engage or this one, uh, engaging men of color, because what we're trying to do is engage African-American, Latino, Asian men who are often not coming into treatment, went through a year-long process, workshops, those kinds of things, using that process to develop the, the um, concept that you see there. Uh, and this one, um, another example of the uh, East Asian or the Asian community, uh, which has identified gambling as a huge issue in Philadelphia. Um, they developed this one. Uh, and the point is, these are communities that had we gone into those communities and said, hi, I'm the mental health commissioner, I'd like to talk to you about gambling addiction, we would have gotten 10 people. Uh, these uh, projects, we literally get hundreds of people to engage with us, with us. My point is this, that if we're talking about moving to population health, I think there are tremendous opportunities, I think it's gonna take a lot of innovation, and I think that that's where we as psychologists can shine. So I'll end by um, saying this. I think as long as, if we continue to view ourselves as primarily deliverers of psychological services, um, as opposed to mental health experts who can provide a whole range of, of services to community, including psychological services, but consultation, the ability to develop programs, I think we have a tremendous amount of opportunities that are there. And the key will be to, is this, to show how doing these kinds of community interventions can help save healthcare costs. And I absolutely believe that. When we reach people who would never, ordinarily not come into treatment, but we can get to them, get to them early, we know that that can save uh, healthcare dollars, increase, um, increase uh, health outcomes, and ultimately make systems better. So thank you, I hope I've uh, been able to stimulate your thinking a lot, and I love being a psychologist. Thank you. Thank you.